today we have a really fantastic uh, presentation presented, getting ready for you, all about estrogen and your fertility, which is a topic I've actually seen come up in the group a couple times this week. So I think that was really fitting timing. Reminder of the live masterclass happening on Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. You still have time to register. Spots are filling up. Um, we're almost at about 100 people, which is the capacity for the webinar. So if you want to get in there, make sure you get your spot, grab your Zoom link, come join us live on Monday so that I can give you a wonderful gift uh, for joining me. Let's chat and figure out how we can help each other. You'll get to learn a little bit of information on the webinar about fertility confidence method and how we can actually work together to improve your fertility and this is one of the last times you're going to get into fertility confidence method at 2020 pricing. So if you want to secure your spot, if you want to work together, now is the time before the price goes up in January. So make sure you grab your call. We have a few spots open left for the rest of the year, but I can see a thumbs up. So I'm assuming that means you can hear me. So let's get going with estrogen and its role in fertility. So with fertility, we put a lot of emphasis on progesterone. You know, progesterone is a really important factor for maintaining pregnancy and fertility success, but estrogen actually plays a really, really crucial role as well in that first half of your cycle. So I am going to bring up a picture. Hopefully that's not how I do it. it keeps disappearing. Yay, it worked. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see the menstrual cycle here. So this is an accurate representation of what happens through your cycle with your temp, your LH, your FSH, your pituitary hormones, your estrogen, your progesterone, your endometrium, and then at the top, your ovulation. So we can see down in this third bar where your estrogen and progesterone are, our estrogen is in gray. And it's increasing over our follicular phase, that first half of your cycle before ovulation. We need this estrogen surge to happen to actually stimulate follicle maturation. So to tell your body mature follicle, mature follicle, mature follicle, it's going to reach a peak. At that peak, it tells your body time is now. Give me my LH surge. Your LH surges, that drops, your estrogen drops, your body releases an egg. Over luteal phase, your estrogen does have a second increase, but it's just not as dramatic as that first one. So the follicular phase is where we really need that estrogen to do its job. And if it's low, we aren't going to see a good healthy egg being released. We're going to have a long follicular phase, so potentially a long irregular cycle, and we might have more immature follicles and we also might not see egg white cervical mucus. So estrogen actually stimulates the cervix to make that egg white cervical mucus, which we know from previous discussions is really important for uh, sperm to survive in the vaginal canal. It makes the vaginal canal more basic, which is typically an acidic environment, and it allows sperm to have a little slippery highway to get up to where it needs to go in good amount of time. So we need that cervical mucus to be there and that is actually stimulated by estrogen. So this follicular phase is really where we're the most concerned about our estrogen production. But what we'll find out in a second, if your estrogen is too high throughout your cycle, it is going to have a negative impact in this luteal phase as well. So let me pull myself back up here and flip that picture off. What exactly does that look like? So when your estrogen is low, this is something that we know happens naturally as we age. We know that when we enter perimenopause, not actually, I'm going to retract that statement. <laughs> when we enter menopause, our estrogen has declined. We stop cycling, but we can still have low estrogen when we are young as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that might be happening. But what are some symptoms? What might you be feeling? What might your body be trying to tell you if you have low estrogen? So we're thinking about hot flashes and night sweats, those kind of run in the mill standard menopause symptoms also can be a cortisol issue, which is why testing becomes important. Vaginal dryness, bladder issues. So 
urgency, frequency due to loosening of those muscles, uh, frequent bladder infections or UTIs can actually be due to low estrogen and increased damage and dryness and allowing for bacteria to be introduced, poor memory or brain fog, weight gain, hair thinning, skin sagging or wrinkles, all of those can be signs of low estrogen, as well as when we think of our fertility journey, no egg white cervical mucus production, long follicular phase can also be signs of low estrogen. When our estrogen is low, you're at a higher risk of things like osteoporosis, high blood pressure, heart disease, insulin resistance, uh, high cholesterol. So estrogen has a really large role in our metabolic and cardiac health. So even beyond fertility, when our estrogen is low, we wanna be doing things to help improve those levels so that we have a healthier lifestyle, so that our heart health is stronger and we're not as high risk for certain long-term conditions. Like I said, naturally as you age, it's going to decline. I'm not gonna go into much detail because this is not what we're here to learn about, obviously, but there's lots of things we can do with bioidentical hormones to help replace if needed. However, we do see this in younger women as well. High estrogen, on the other hand, a lot more common in our age demographic of you know our 20s, 30s, and even 40s. This can also be seen in perimenopause, and as you age, your estrogen doesn't just linearly decrease, it actually does a lot of this. <laughs> Makes you feel really unwell, it's like a roller coaster ride, and we can be having things like that happen when we're young as well, which is again why testing can be really helpful. It's a balance between estrogen and progesterone that's really important. So if your progesterone is fine, but your estrogen is off, it's going to make you feel wonky. If both are off, it's going to make you feel worse. If your estrogen is normal, but your progesterone is low, it's going to make you feel estrogen dominant. The two really play off of each other. So again, testing is really what's going to be helpful. A lot of products on the market for women to help with PMS, to help with periods or regulating cycles and even fertility have products in them that lower estrogen, which is fine if you truly are estrogen dominant. But if you're not and you're taking these things, we actually might be doing more harm than good. We might actually be turning off ovulation. We might actually be turning off your cervical mucus production. So we want to be really careful with things that are just blanket statement good for your period because they might not be good for your period. And I think that's really important to note. What high estrogen in your body might look like, depression and anxiety, irritability, rage, mood swings, heavy periods, heavy painful periods, low energy, difficulty sleeping, uh, headaches or migraines, especially right before your period, weight gain, uh, low libido, all of these things can be signs of high estrogen as well. Any signs of low progesterone can be high estrogen because if remember what we said, and I'm not going to pull the chart back up, but if your estrogen, maybe I will at the end, if your estrogen is high, but your progesterone is low or normal, you're going to feel that low progesterone a heck of a lot more. And you're going to feel that high est estrogen as well. How high estrogen can happen in the body is poor metabolism, um, poor liver detoxification, constipation, allowing that estrogen to actually recirculate through your body. So we really want to work on detox pathways. Your estrogen is detoxified through three different pathways, a good one and two danger pathways. So we want to make sure you're having a preference for that 2-hydroxy good estrogen pathway. The other two pathways, we have more uh, capability for reuptake um, and and DNA damage. So putting you at a higher risk of estrogen dominant cancer. So detoxification of estrogen becomes really important, but also when we're dealing with high estrogen, what's happening in your gut? Is beta glucuronidase high and allowing your gut to actually recirculate that estrogen? Are you maybe getting exposures from your environment, plastics, phthalates, parabens, your endocrine disrupting chemicals? Are they building up in your system? Are they promoting estrogen uh, production, that might be why your estrogen is high. High adipose tissue or fat, being overweight, adipose tissue actually makes estrogen. So the more fat you have on the body, the more estrogen you're going to make, the more estrogen you make, the more likely you are to gain weight. It becomes a really vicious cycle. 
So we want to work on reestablishing proper hormone production. We want to look at insulin resistance, your thyroid, your cortisol, the hormones that are impacting weight. And we want to tackle weight loss from that angle because it's going to be reestablishing your metabolism, working with your hormones that will actually be able to get the weight down. And as you lose the weight, your body will make less estrogen, making it easier and easier as we reestablish that balance. Endometriosis is also another condition that can have high estrogen. And it's the endometrial tissue, the extra endometrial tissue in your body with endometriosis that pumps out high amounts of estrogen, which then make you feel very horrible and very estrogen dominant and two becomes a bit of a vicious circle with promoting more estrogen estrogen loves other estrogen so it's just going to keep promoting 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 morning vicky so how do we know we're going to do some testing for fertility we're going to test on day three of your cycle day three four five is typically where we like to see it but day three is best you're going to check your estradiol or E2. You also want to check that with LH and FSH. So if you're doing day three blood work, do the whole shebang, do all the day threes, LH, FSH, estradiol. That's going to give us a good representation of what's happening in that early moments of your follicular phase. If you're in the fertility clinic and you're doing cycle monitoring, they'll also be monitoring your estrogen production over that follicular phase, which is very helpful. Outside of the fertility clinic, we're just, we're not sending you to the lab every other day. To check your estrogen uh would it be helpful if we did sure but it also would be expensive then if you're doing your post ovulation progesterone it might not be a bad idea to throw an estrogen check there as well just to gauge estrogen dominance so we don't have or at least i don't have um good optimal full uh, sorry luteal levels of estrogen in comparison to progesterone but we obviously don't want them to be too high. So if you're someone who has heavy painful periods, endometriosis, um, weight gain, hair loss, you know, all the high estrogen symptoms, especially leading into those couple weeks or week before your period, it might be worthwhile to actually also check it in your luteal phase as well. But what are we going to do about it? So we know now from a fertility standpoint that low estrogen is going to impact cervical mucus production. It's also going to impact ovulation. So if your estrogen is low, your body's not going to be the necess getting the necessary signals that it needs to pump out the pituitary hormones, LH and FSH. So the follicles aren't going to mature. You aren't likely going to ovulate, may I mean, maybe at all, but if you do, it might be delayed. The egg might not actually be fully matured. It might be smaller in size. So that can definitely impact from a quality perspective. We also know if estrogen is high, it might be causing too thick of a lining. It's promoting inflammation if it's too high, which we know that any inflammation in the body is going to negatively impact fertility. And then we also know that it's going to be counteracting progesterone in that luteal phase. So you might make okay amounts of progesterone, but if your body is estrogen dominant, it can't listen to those signals the way that it should be. So when it comes to estrogen and fertility, we're concerned about both angles, the high and the low. We really do need to find that optimal middle ground. And I find this is a piece of the puzzle that often gets overlooked in you know, primary care workups and even in a lot of fertility clinics. And if you're in the realm of medicated cycles, we're worrying about it a little bit less because we're actually using your estrogen in pulling it in low, pulling it low really with letrozole to help stimulate follicle maturation. So we're not as concerned about it from a low standpoint when we're dealing with medicated cycles, but we also want to make sure that you're not rebounding high post um, IUI or post IVF as well. So what do we need to do if estrogen is high? We need to open up detoxification pathways. We need to make sure that your gut is healthy and happy. There's no dysbiosis and that you're pooping regularly. All of these things are really important. This is why in Fertility Confidence Method, we actually start pillar one with a detox. I'm trying to rebrand it to a kickstart because I don't think detox is a very healthy, happy word. <laughs> I think we can take detox into many different contexts. And for me, it's not about deprivation. It's about opening detox pathways, 
having healthy guts, making sure we're reducing environmental toxin exposures, and we're setting fertility foundations, our sleep, movement, mindfulness, and nutrition. All four of these things are really important for healthy detox pathways. We want to make sure that you're having a healthy bowel movement. If you're constipated, you're allowing your body to have an opportunity to reuptake that estrogen into your system. So Fertility goes beyond your uterus. We actually need to look at the body as a whole. And I think this is a really important strategy that most women either glaze over or don't know about when they're really trying to figure out what's going on for them. This is why I do what I do. I want to fill in those gaps that you might not be getting in your current care team in terms of looking at you and your partner as a holistic entity instead of just narrow focusing in on your uterus and maybe your ovaries and the testicles. <laughs> that tends to be really all we look at. So when we're thinking about detoxification, certain nutrients are really important. The good news is a lot of these things are in a prenatal. So if you're taking a prenatal, fantastic, but we want to make sure you're getting good quality and you're getting good therapeutic dosages. B vitamins are probably one of the most underrated and important strategies we can use for good health. We don't get a lot of B vitamins. I mean, we get an okay amount from our food, but we're often deficient, especially as women, because our hormones use B vitamins every step along the way to actually be produced and then to be detoxified and removed. The birth control pill depletes B vitamins, especially B6 and B12. So these two are really important, especially for energy, for hair health, um, we use B6 if you're feeling nauseous when you're pregnant. So I have a theory that if your B6 is really low going into pregnancy, nausea might actually be worse. It's a theory. I haven't actually seen any studies. But B, B vitamins are important. Zinc, vitamin C, all really helpful for liver detoxification and all usually included in a prenatal, which is really nice. N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, resveratrol, curcumin, all also nice supportive products and herbs that you can use. Um, we can even get into using DIM, I3C, or calcium D glucuronate in certain situations if your blood work entails. Again, this is not medical advice. Please always talk to a provider before you start anything, especially if you're going to mess with your hormones. You do not want to take things that are going to reduce estrogen if your estrogen is not high you will not feel good and you'll probably do more damage. So these are products that you, I mean, B vitamins, vitamin C, very innocuous. I'm talking more like the herbals, the DIM, the I3C, the beta glucuronidase. We don't want to mess around with those things if we don't need it. So it's really important you're working with a practitioner that understands what they're doing. You also want to look at exposures, plastic, BPA, parabens, phthalates, all of these things cumulatively over time will impact estrogen, will impact your hormones. So using things like environmental working groups, skin deep, slowly over time, uh, swapping out products as things run out. It doesn't need to be a big free-for-all in your bathroom where you throw everything in the trash and start over. Use up what you have. Now you know better. Find a product that's better for your skin, better for your body. It doesn't need to be an all or nothing approach. We are maybe 90% green in our household. We still have some conventional products. And for me, I'm okay with that. I, you know, there's certain things I just think work really well and I'm not really willing to give them up. <laughs> but for the most part, our exposures to these products in our home are very low. We can't control it in every aspect of our life. I'm fine with that. And it's more of a overtime approach and decreasing exposure, less accumulation. So again, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. If you're currently using a lot of conventional cleaning products, hair products, skincare products, makeup, that's fine. As things run out, let's find you a better swap. The other piece is plastic. I think this is a really big one to mention with fertility because we actually do have quite a bit of research in BPA and uh, male factor fertility actually, and it decreasing sperm concentration, motility, and morphology and that men who have low sperm quality have higher levels of BPA in their urine, meaning you've been exposed to a lot of plastic, it sits around in the body, we're seeing that actually have negative impact on sperm. So we wanna look at our plastic exposure. It, and this, I mean, I mentioned the male study because that's what I know off the top of my head. We do have female studies in BPA as well, but not as many. 
And the male studies just tend to be easier. It's easier to test sperm than it is to test female factor fertility, but I think it's going to go both ways. It's a fairly potent endocrine disrupting chemical. So looking at your life and how much plastic you have in your life, how much exposure, if you're heating food up in plastic, stop. If you are drinking out of plastic water bottles every day, definitely swap it out for a stainless or a glass, especially if you refill that plastic or it's been sitting in plastic for a really long time, start to think about these habits. Those are the biggest ones. And then food containers. So if we can swap, slowly start swapping out for glass, you're going to notice a lot of your your general day-to-day plastic exposure decreases just right there. There's obviously going to be things in your home. You know, there's, it's really difficult being a mother. It's really difficult to keep plastic toys out of our house. Um, I gave up very quickly (laughs) that that just wasn't going to happen. But where I can find things that are a little bit healthier, I definitely do. And it's all just about having this knowledge and using it in times that make sense. And sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. If you're on the go and you have to eat out of plastic and it's that or don't eat at all, you eat. You know, we don't have to make some concessions here. We don't have to be perfect. When we have um, low, oh my goodness, I almost forgot what I was talking about for a second there. When we have low estrogen, which we now know is definitely a big factor for those long irregular cycles and being more concerned with a fertility standpoint, we need to think of First and foremost, the building blocks and how our body is responding to hormone production. Hormones are made from cholesterol. Hormones are made from healthy fats. If you are eating a low fat diet, if you're not getting enough calories, if you're really not eating much at all, your body doesn't actually have the building blocks it needs to make estrogen. All the supplements in the world, all the herbs, all the medications truthfully aren't going to do much for you if the tools and building blocks to actually produce the hormones aren't there. So diet is always the first place you want to look when we're dealing with hormonal imbalances. So really take a good peek at what are you eating right now? Are you getting enough healthy fats for your body? What does that look like for you? And then go into, okay, how else can I improve my estrogen? Things like Don Quay, fennel, shatavari are all wonderful herbs that can really help to increase estrogen. Things I like to use in that follicular phase to stimulate earlier ovulation, to help with um, egg white cervical mucus production. So things that you can also look into with your practitioner. So let me see if there's any questions. If you're here with me live and you have a question about estrogen and fertility, please post it. I'm going to pull over my labs because I wanted to give you what we're looking for from an optimal standpoint. I literally just keep these beside my desk and I look at them every day. So when we're talking about US units, so PG per mil, we're ideally looking for a day three estradiol of about 30 to 50. That's where we'd like to see that. When we are talking in my Canadian units, we are looking for a day three estradiol around 100 picomoles, uh, PMOL per liter. 90 to like 120 is where I like to see it. So that's follicular phase day three. Like I mentioned earlier, I can't comment on the um, on the luteal phase off the top of my head. So Vicky, I'm going to read out what you put here for us. So I was on hydroxyprogesterone for a couple months because the doctor said my lining was thick. I have not taken it since because I have not gone back to see if I still need it. My period has gotten a lot better, a lot less clotting, flow is not as heavy could that mean I'm estrogen dominant? Potentially. Yeah, I would definitely, definitely want to do estrogen testing with you, both likely follicular and luteal, just to see, because that could be why your lining is getting too thick. So for sure. So Teresa says, I just mentioned Shadavari. Would that be safe to use on any spectrum of levels? Uh, You mean like any spectrum of estrogen? I think, Teresa, that's what you mean. Uh, I know there's a delay, so I'm just going to kind of keep rambling on here. So Shadavari is a pretty gentle herb in and of itself. So um, I don't remember off the top of my head, though, if it's an estrogen modulator, meaning will it bring it up if it's low? Will it bring it down if it's high? Um, So if you post in the group and remind me, I will definitely look into that for you. I just know from what my brain is telling me (laughs) that I typically use it in the follicular phase um, only, but I have had mentors that use it 
all across the cycle. So I would imagine that re regardless of like spectrum of estrogen, it's likely safe, but you always want to be a little bit careful with hormonal herbs. So Marquina wants to know my thoughts on Vitex. I love Vitex. Um, it's great pituitary stimulation with LH and FSH to help with maturation of follicle. It's also helpful to improve uh, the health of the corpus luteum, which is what makes progesterone. And that's really what we use Vitex for oftentimes is that progesterone help. So I don't typically bring Vitex in in a situation where we're dealing with low estrogen solely, but if we were dealing with low progesterone, I would probably use a Vitex. <laughs> Teresa, you felt that intuitive call to the Shadavari, eh? It's really wonderful. And if you're using it like as a powder, in a smoothie or a drink or whatever, dosage or a tea, like dosage is so, so low that I honestly wouldn't be that worried about it um, unless you were using like heaps and heaps and heaps of it. Then I would definitely say like get some testing just to be safe, but it is wonderful. Okay, you guys, I hope this was really helpful. If you're watching the replay and you have a question, please tag me in the comments. Happy to answer and come back. Um, and don't forget about the live masterclass. If you haven't attended my three secrets to getting pregnant, we go live Monday night at 8 PM Eastern. You're going to get a little info on the masterclass about fertility confidence method and how we can work together and how you can solidify that 2020 pricing, which is going to go away at the end of the month. So I hope you guys all have a very wonderful weekend and I will chat with you soon.